BMP. Um, it's a pretty hot topic. Hey Mike. Can you, yep. Can you get? Yeah, it's kind of hard to hear you. Can you get closer to your mic? Yep. Okay. How's that? Better. Perfect. Thank oh, you, sir. Sorry, I had, it, I had it up a little bit too high. Sometimes I don't want to spit into it, but okay. So yeah, as as we talked about, um, today's um, presentation is going to deal with uh, innovative concepts in rainwater and stormwater design. Um, we've been doing this uh, quite a long time. Uh, so we'll talk a lot about um, you know some of the pitfalls that we've come across, um, some of the things that we've seen that have worked, uh, you know, in you know in our designs and our concepts. Um, but we'll talk a little bit about methodology. Um, why are we going to utilize stormwater? I mean, rainwater as a stormwater harvesting tool. <coughs> Excuse me. We'll talk about applications. Um, I think that's super important when we talk about design concepts. Um, we don't want to use like a one size fits all scenario because it just doesn't it doesn't work that way. Each building is different. Each building is unique. Um, the way that that water is being used inside that building, um, it make, it goes a long way. It makes it makes a big big difference. And then at the end of the day, you know who's going to inherit this system? You know we want to try to make it as simple as possible, but yet um, you know we want to be able to monitor and manage most aspects. You know this through a BMS or or you know some sort of a, a controllable system. Um, lead. Uh, lid uh, water quality. Um, you're going to hear me talk a lot about water quality uh, and risks associated with same. Um, you know, people think that you know rainwater uh, as it falls, um, you know, is very very soft, very very um, you know e you know sort of easy to manage. But there are certain things that we need to do to that. You know, if we are bringing in into the building for reuse, uh, codes and standards. I think they're finally starting to catch up with you know where we're at today. Um, kind of giving us a, a framework as to. You know what we need. We'll talk about performance standards. You know, as they're in versus technology standards and equipment. You know, and that sort of thing. ASPE has been big. ARCS has been big, and then obviously IPC and UPC um, system design. I'm going to get into the components of system design and you know really kind of dig into that and show you some of the different techniques that you know that are used out there. Not only we use, but you know other uh, vendors and people that that are sort of you know driving the bus here use. Um, you know, then you know most of the applications we're going to talk about. All the applications we're going to talk about today are, are mostly industrial and process water apps. So, learning objectives. This being an ASPE presentation, obviously we want to have some sort of learning learning objective. Hopefully, you, know, you, you folks will get something you know out of this presentation. Um, but we're going to talk about the basic designs, you know, common water systems, uh, you know, for and for non potable water applications, uh, the innovative use of rainwater for stormwater management, and the, the, the treatment techniques that are needed, um, you know, as, sort of as that pre filtration, uh, you know, to make sure that the rest of the system doesn't work, you know, as hard as it it does it needs to. Uh, codes and standards governing this, you know, obviously that's super important when we're writing specifications, when you guys are looking at designs and authority having jurisdictions. Um, and we want to be able to meet those those uh, those design standards, methodologies, treatment, the various types of products that are out there today, and, and you know, and 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 the ongoing, um, you know, uh, need for you know for better products and you know again simpler simpler uh, systems and and designs based on the, uh, the 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 building that the system is being used for, and then lessons learned. Um, you know, we I'm a big fan of. You know, if you fall down, you get back up and you're that much better for it because you understand what happened. Um, I think that's, you know, that's kind of important. People sort of try to gloss over some things, but um, we've been again doing this a long time and and, uh, you know, we, we've, we've definitely, you know, lessons learned. Uh, and we want to be able to convey that to, uh, you know, to you folks, uh, you know, from the engineering and design side of it. So. Um, water conservation, um, you know, it's, it's always like, why, you know, why do we need to, you know, capture rainwater? I mean, I got, you know, we go, you know, we got, do, I do presentations in Michigan and, you know, they got five, you know, huge oceans up there, you know, you do, you know, all over the, you know, all over the country and, you know, people talk about it, but it's all about water availability. It's getting, you know, more and more expensive to pull water out of the ground. Um, you have surface water states like I did a presentation in Georgia right after the Lake of the Lake Lanier, <clears throat> um, you know, a catastrophe. You know where they they almost ran out of water. Um, you know they're fighting right now with you know other surface water states to you know to to to, to find out you know who's going to you know be able to you know pull so much water from the lake and from various rivers and streams. Um, so it's 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 a, it's a challenge. Um, it's going to be uh, you know something that we're going to be battling over. Uh, in the future years, uh, water consumption. Um, you know, 
population growth. Um, you know, the world just keeps getting bigger and bigger, and we just pull billions of gallons of water out for, you know, for irrigation, for cooling. You know, just uh, we talk a lot about cooling tower and cooling tower make up water. Um, you know, it's just the, you know, that it's the, the, the intensification of growth um, has really kind of put us in a, in, you know, in that predicament. Um, you know, because as I'll say a bunch of times today, you know, 85% of the water that we use on a daily basis is used for non potable water applications. Um, so being able to conserve that. Um, the biggest one I think today uh, that we need to deal with is is water quality. Um, our water quality stinks. Um, I always show this slide, um, and you know everybody kind of laughs at it. But you know the the, the access to safe drinking water uh, is becoming critical uh, in the in the United States. I mean, look at the you know, these infrastructure bills that are being held up. Um, our infrastructure stinks. I mean, we just have. Uh, it's poor. I uh, look at Flint, uh, Michigan, um, you know, and a lot of that has to do with runoff. I mean, pollutants from runoff are just, you know, killing our water system. Um, look at, uh, I was down in Florida a couple weeks ago um, and, you know, red tide. I mean, that's, that's all from runoff. That's all from the sugar gains and, and, you know, uh, you know, in the inlands, uh, that all just gets fed to the, to the oceans. And, you know, there's a, you know, biological reaction that takes place. Uh, so water quality uh, is huge and that is dictated by, um, by, Construction and by uh, you know <clears throat> the, the you know intensification of of what we're doing here. Oops, sorry, a little bit ahead of myself here. So again, just water quality. Um, you know, just you know how we you know how we manage our water and potable water is just is just a huge uh, you know it's a huge thing for for us to, uh, to, you know to try to tackle here. Um, rainwater harvesting. So so the benefits here. Rainwater harvesting is a stormwater management tool. We've just seen this increase um, you know in popularity uh, over the last five or six years uh, mainstream. It's just it just seems like every state uh, is using that stormwater management regulations uh, to garner um, you know uh, you know approvals for um, you know reduction in sanitary sewer overflows, um, reduction in combined sewer overflows. Right outside of Boston here, Boston's the second oldest infrastructure in the country besides Philadelphia. Uh, we have combined sewers. Um, I know when Philadelphia went through all of their consent decree, uh, they figured it was going to cost them nine billion dollars to update their infrastructure. I don't think I don't think anybody has nine billion dollars to be able to, um, you know, to be able to waste not waste or you know to be able to go into you know to do the uh, the infrastructure. So it's uh, it's important that we look at you know ways to be able to manage that. Um, you know, from a risk standpoint, um, lead, you know, we'll talk a little bit about lead and lid retention and detention systems. Um, you know, rainwater harvesting is the only BMP uh, that gives us uh, an alternate to, to that, to that water system, to that water source. So we're actually creating something that uh, that was not there, you know, to begin with. So decentralized systems, um, zero impact. Um, you have places like DC. Um, they, if you, if you're going to get a permit to do any infrastructure, or to build a building or anything like that, you cannot discharge your stormwater off of that site. You got to use it. You got to store it. You got to do something with it. Uh, same in Connecticut. There's areas of Connecticut that are, that are just zero impact, zero runoff. Uh, erosion control is big, uh, you know, when it comes to these sort of systems and you know the design and you know when we're working with you know that you know that um, you know civil engineer and. and, and you know, in the beginning of these projects, so it's it's just a, it's just a key component, uh, and the reduction, and you know, to help benefit, um, you know, what we're trying to do here, um, reduction in flooding, and then minimizing you know non-point source uh, pollution. Uh, lead um, can't you know we can't say enough about lead. We don't see as many lead projects, you know, as we did in the past, um, but we you know we just feel that they are still you know kind of driving the bus as far as as from a design standpoint, I mean, they give us a lot of input as to, you know, what we need to do, um, you know, for, as, as a pre-treatment program, you know, from a storage, you know, from a storage aspect, from a sizing aspect, um, you know, just using uh, sustainable products, um, you know, within the system, <clears throat> you know, making sure that, um, you know, our, the systems were efficient. Um, they gave us, you know, ideas for innovative design. Um, so they really kind of, you know, you know, really kind of helped us out, but we don't, again, we, I would say, you know, it used to be 70, 30, 70% of the projects that we did were lead, 30% non. Now we're seeing it probably the other way around, more like 60, 40, 60% are, are non lead projects, you know, people trying to be the good neighbor. Um, it's only, and it's only because the advent of stormwater management regulations and stormwater regs, um, 
that have kind of given the return on investment a whole different you know, a whole different view, a whole different aspect as to you know how we go about these systems and how these systems are in implemented uh, into the buildings and water reuse and uh, you know and everything associated with that. But we do owe lead you know a big uh, you know a big you know, kudos you know in that and, and that they did give us. And I keep you know talking about innovation because you got to be innovative. Um, you know, you want to give, you know, that end user, that customer that's spending, you know, X amount of dollars, um, you know, on these systems, um, you know, something that, you know, that they can use, something that they can hang their hat on, um, you know, and something that they can be proud of, but something that they can, you know, that's going to be there, you know, for their use for, you know, um, years and years to come. Uh, applications, um, as we talked about, uh, most of these applications or all of these applications that we're going to talk about today are for non-potable use. Uh, reuse of non-potable water, um, and we have uh, we've done we've done it all. We've done process water systems where they're closed loop systems, and people using you know water for cooling or for heating or for uh, you know washing. Um, you know, uh, irrigation is probably you know the most mainstream. It's you know, one of the systems that we'll talk about today. Um, cooling tower makeup water is another big big one. Um, just just an explosion of cooling tower makeup. Um, toilet flushing, obviously, being you know the mainstream, but you know again, we're going to talk about it. We nail it right down from a design standpoint, from the you know the very first uh, time we take it off the roof, or we take it off a paved area, uh, we store it, um, we treat it, and we and we then we you know send it back through the building, you know, in certain means. But you know each sort of application, you know, has its own, um, you know, and building has its own sort of uh, system and design. Uh, if we're looking at cooling tower makeup water, um, in the past, uh, you know, we've just learned, you know, just a huge lesson with cooling tower makeup water. We just thought, hey, you know, you don't need to, we don't need to do much to it. We're going to store it. We're going to run it through a couple of simple little filtration systems and send it up to the, you know, to the evaporator and, and we're going to be good. But we've just found that that's, you know, there's more to it than that. It talks, you know, we need to look at really, you know, that's sort of the, probably the biggest system that we make that has the most components in there from a water quality standpoint, because um, pH is different. Um, you know, with, with rainwater pH, it's, you know, you're right around that seven. When you're sending water up to a cooling tower, you want to be in the high sevens. Um, so, we you know, again, we've learned that lesson. Uh, media filters are better than, um, vortex type filters because they <clears throat> they really kind of you know get you know get us down to that micron level that we need to be at so we're not you know you know creating any issues you know within the you know the cooling tower loop uh, you know and within the system you know system itself and then organics we don't want any organics so the less we can do um, you know, from somebody actually processing that water after the fact, um, you know, the better off we are. So, cooling tower makeup water um, from a filtration and disinfection standpoint is probably the, you know, that that bigger uh, of the systems, uh, you know, that that, that are need to be designed and you know, they take a, a few more components in there uh, from a water quality standpoint. Uh, toilet flushing, that's sort of the second tier, if I guess, if you will. Uh, from a toilet flushing, we're bringing water inside the building, so we want to design that. Sediment control is big. We don't want to be uh, clogging up anybody's flush valves. Uh, we want to make sure that we have, you know, good disinfection. You know, in some instances, the authority having jurisdiction is going to tell us we have to color that water. Um, we use a blue dye. Uh, it's pretty standard uh, in the industry, but it kind of differentiates between the non-potable and the potable water. Um, but there is, you know, again, there is some, uh, you know, some media filtration, um, you know, in there uh, that that will be used, you know, again, to get you down to those micron levels that we that we need to be at. Lastly, uh, you know, from 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 an application standpoint, probably the simpler of you know of, of most of these applications is irrigation. Um, there's a lot of different types of uh, media filters or filters that we can use from from a sediment perspective, um, and then on the uh, on the disinfection side of it, um, you know, chemical free disinfection is obviously the better means uh, to go, but there's all different types of filters that we'll talk about, you know, when we, when we look at irrigation and irrigation systems, but, you know, you can kind of see the theme here at a minimum, uh, the codes and standards tell us that we have to, um, you know, do some sort of sediment reduction, particulate removal, uh, and then some sort of disinfection um, that is at a minimum. And that's more of a liability kind of a. A thing I think for us at Highland and, and some, for other manufacturers that do these type of systems, you know, people talk about, oh, you know, I don't need, I don't need anything on the disinfection side of it. Again, I'm just using it for irrigation. But again, we're blowing water through the air, right? It's some sort of um, 
you know, sprinkler head or drip irrigation or something like that. Um, you know, there's just, you know, there just could be some issues there, you know, associated with water quality. So we want to be very diligent and, you know, sort of how we go about um, designing the system or, you know, or you guys looking at designing the system for, you know, to meet, you know, to meet these needs. <clears throat> Codes and standards. Um, plumbing codes and standards have you know, really just kind of come a long way. I remember when, when there was hardly anything, there was one sentence, I think, in the IPC code for the longest time. UPC was, was sort of the same way. You know, they came up with these green building infrastructure um, um, supplements, um, but now there's just, just a lot more to it. Um, uh, the one thing, you know, with, with the codes and, you know, even when, you know, ARCSA and ASPE came out with their uh, joint rainwater catchment systems. Um, they talk a lot about technology. They talk a lot about okay, you need to have a screen filter to you know for your first flush, and you need to do you know. Uh, it was again, it was more technology based, more equipment based, not even technology based. Um, and you know, there's certain things that we saw that we know as a manufacturer that may not work as well, or may be more of a of a maintenance intrusive type of of setup, you know, rather than of utilizing something like, um, you know, what uh, NSF does, and this is more for the gray water side of it, but telling, you know, these are the parameters that we need to get to. These are the values that I need to get to from a performance standard. You got to be in, you know, at seven for your pH, you got to be your B, you know, your BOD levels need to be, you know, again, less this is less than 10 uh, NTUs. We know that that goes directly to disinfection, uh, proper disinfection techniques when you're talking about UV, People, you know, we don't want any of this, but, you know, from a performance side of it, I would rather see that because, again, all of us manufacturers, we've been, you know, if anybody's still doing this, we've been doing it a long, long time. We know how to get there. We know how to get from point A to point B. And, um, you know, again, the water quality for us, you know, you know at a minimum is, is the most important part of this uh, of this process. I mean, we don't, we don't want to see you know, anybody having any issues with water, their water quality when they're talking about reclaim systems. So performance uh, standards is, again, that's just my preference. Um, but, you know, we see, we do see a lot of, uh, you know, different things coming out there. Uh, MPDES, uh, stormwater regulations, these are just, you know, <clears throat> we see these updated uh, every day, uh, every year. Um, places like, again, like I talked about DC, um, they need to capture, you know, their first, <clears throat> um, you know, first flush, store it. Um, Philadelphia is the same way. They got to capture their, excuse me, their first inch and a half of their rain event and hold it for 72 hours. We're seeing that sort of that theme, Alabama, uh, Birmingham, uh, you know, same kind of thing from a, from a stormwater standpoint, you know, somebody needs to be able to, uh, if they're going to get a permit, they have to capture, you know, a certain amount of water based on rain order intensity. New Orleans is like that, uh, and they have to store it for a certain period of time. And that's all part of their permit process to be able to build that building, right? So, again, again, we'll talk a little bit about storage, and but that's the most expensive part of any of these rainwater systems is the storage aspect of it. So when I talked about return on investment, if you have to do the stormwater reg anyway, it kind of makes the the whole rest of the system a lot more palatable. A lot more easy, um, you know, to to look at from a you know from a cost perspective, you know, as far as the reuse side of it. Because if I have to store 100,000 gallons of water, and that's not out of the question, depending on the size of the building, if I got to store that anyway, and it, you know, it's it's sort of kind of bought and paid for. Why not, you know, be able to reuse that water, you know, in some form or fashion in the building? If you do have irrigation, if you have cooling tower needs, um, you know, if you have a a lot of uh, you know, pe you know, people associated with you know being in that building on a daily basis, uh, it just kind of goes a long way. Um, and then I just you know kind of looked up some of the just being based in Ohio, just some of the you know some of the regulations and you know things that we see in Ohio, and they do have a nice rainwater and land development manual um, that kind of that kind of outlines the credit. That's the first thing anybody asks for is you know, hey, if I'm going to put all this money into these things, am I going to get credit for it? So. Um, and they talk about water balance charts, and I, well, I'll show you a couple of water balance charts that we use, um, you know, here. They talk about, you know, drawdown and, and permanent reuse. Um, so it's a really good, you know, compared to, you know, compared to a lot, they've, they've kind of put a lot in there for the designer to be able to, you know, go back and say, hey, this is, you know, this is kind of like my framework, you know, my building block for how I'm going to design a system and, you know, and what, are, you know, what are my needs and, um, you know, what, are, you know, what are the components that, that are available for me to be able to, you know, to do this design and, you know, and the, and the information that I need to, to, you know, to be able to give to the, 
uh, end user and the authority uh, having jurisdiction. Purple pipe uh, is one of the mainstream, uh, you know, this, this slide is probably one of the oldest slides I have in, in, in my presentation when I haven't changed. Usually I'm a big fan of updating and, and you know, keeping on top of presentations, but purple pipe, um, you know, it's probably the one key, you know, factors that we see in any of these uh, water reuse, water reclamation uh, systems. Um, in Massachusetts, I have to paint my skid purple um, because they, they, can, they, they look so much like a standard potable water system uh, treatment system that, um, you know, we gotta we gotta be able to uh, be able to do that. So, system design. Now we get into sort of the, kind of the nuts and bolts. You know, as I did say, um, I have a lot of people you know ask me during presentations is you know, hey, you know, as rain falls, it's supposed to be clean, clear, soft. You know, it's just you know, it's just a you know, you know very very nice product. But once it hits the surface, once it hits the pa a paved area, a, a roof area, we get that you know the constituents in there that uh, could be harmful um, to you know, again, to a cooling tower application, if it does it have biologics in it, to um, toilet flushing, does it have a lot of sediment, does it have a lot of you know, the other things going on? I mean, you know, but even at the end of the day, seeing, you know, this sort of this tea colored water here on the left hand side, this unprocessed roof water um, is not very palatable, right? It's not very ap appealing to, to the eye. Somebody, you know, knows that there's sort of like that, that glass of water with all that sediment that I showed you earlier uh, in the presentation. Um, you know, it just, it's just, it's just what happens. Um, you know, there could be bird droppings, you know, there could be a lot of things There could be trace oils. There could be, um, you know, just a lot of things, you know, on that surface that, um, you know, mother nature washes off, uh, in a rain event. Um, so we have to have, you know, a process to get us from, you know, this tea colored water to this nice looking water over here uh, on the right hand side. And, uh, you know, there is a, you know, a means to an end when it comes to filtration and disinfection and people can do it in a lot of different ways. But, um, you know, you, as you can, you know, as you, you know, hear me talk about, um, depending on that infrastructure, that type of building, um, you know, these, these components could change a little bit, but this is sort of, this is, you know, this is rainwater, uh, 101 right here on um, these, these are the, um, you know, the sort of the building blocks that you need, you know, within the system to be able to, um, you know, get a good, you know, end product um, first being that first flush that first uh, 95 you know the, the first 10 or 15 minutes of that rain event you get 95 percent of the pollutants uh, you know off of that surface um, you know go you know go through that system so first flush uh, is probably the mo one of the most important uh, parts of these type systems understanding where we're pulling water from is it a small roof is it a big roof is is there some sort of paved area going along with it or is it a parking deck um, that first flush filter is again it's the first line of defense to my storage um storage probably the most expensive part of these systems but as i talked about if we have to do stormwater management anyway if there's a regulation that says hey you gotta you know you gotta have some sort of means of storage um whether it's above ground or below ground a, a concrete a you know a steel tank a fiberglass plastic uh, doesn't make any difference and we have to protect that storage as well um too many times you know, we've seen you know somebody not putting in a first flush filter or um you know, maybe not understanding that you know, we, you know we're pulling water out of this storage vessel um we got to be able to protect it it's got to be uh, you know protected in some sort of fashion freeze protection um you know protection from sediment from sand biologics uh, groundwater infiltration um, we've seen that in the past um, it's just uh, super important to you know to understand storage compatibility of materials as you kind of go through uh, the systems and, and, and system design um, pumps. I got to get water out of that storage vessel, uh, some form, you know, somehow, some way. So again, this was some of the pitfalls that we've learned is that, you know, people, you know, look at the storage, you know, aspect of it, large concrete vessels, and they forget that you know, there's got to be pumps that go down in there. Um, and then they got to have access to those pumps. So super important. You know, from a design standpoint, to get with everybody uh, on the design side of it to know exactly, you know, how uh, all of these components are going to be put together uh, and be able to function, uh, you know, in a, in, a, in that unique in that unique manner. And when we get to above grade, we have the filtration and disinfection. Filtration and disinfection um, is designed based on flow, right? So the lower flow I have maybe from my storage vessel through my filtration and disinfection, you know, sort of keeps that at a, at a, at a manageable size. Uh, we, we could potentially go to a day tank. Um, you're going to see some systems that go directly through. Filter, you know, we, we're going to we're going to just pump right through filtration and disinfection uh, and right to the source. 
Um, but again, these are sort of, you know, sort of some design ideas that we all look at when we're first looking at these systems. And then we have a booster pump to get us through to irrigation, to cooling tower, makeup water to do whatever we need to do. So, and um, then there could be, you know, optional dye in here and then we need makeup water. I mean, you know, cause sometimes, you know, you're not going to have enough storage. You're going to have dry, the dry season, but, um, we do need uh, some sort of makeup and sort or some sort of backup water, uh, uh for the. Uh, for these systems, <clears throat> sort of a, a schematic design of of a standard layout. Um, obviously, an underground tank um, is going to be a, a little bit more um, safer. Um, we don't have to worry about freeze protection. Uh, you know, you know, in in this type of design, um, goes underground. Uh, bacteria, you know, in in the cooler temperatures, you know, bacteria doesn't like that those cold temperatures. So it's you know, again, it's it's a little bit more. Um, Efficient from that, you know, from a, from a design standpoint, um, but, you know, are secure, uh, if you will, but, you know, again, the, the components are the same. We have a first, you know, a first flush filter, um, and it could be, again, depending on where we're pulling water from, um, we have a storage vessel, uh, we're pumping out of that vessel, um, access to the pumps, floating suctions, uh, you know, are super important, uh, skidded designs. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about that, you know, as we kind of go through the some of the details and some of the components that we see, um, but from a design standpoint, from an engineering standpoint, um, the more that we as manufacturers can do at the factory, uh, the more we can put together uh, at the factory, the more we can plumb, the more we can wire, um, the better product that goes to the end user, the better product that goes to the contractor uh, who's putting all of these things together, right? It's just, a, it's try to make that building block approach um, so that everything sort of just kind of, you know, melds together, um, and it, it just, it, to get it in place and plug and play and, and, uh, and they turn it on and, and it works. Um, but, you know, again, these are the sort of the various components. And then, you know, again, it's the same thing. It's sort of, you know, deja vu, right? It's a, just, just in this instance, I have an above ground tank, but again, you can still see the same thing. Um, <clears throat> I have a pump in there. I have a floating suction. All of these components sort of are similar. It just depends on, you know, how we. Uh, you know, how we wrap those together, you know, how they go inside the building um, and, you know, and how they, you know, kind of work together to create, you know, that water that's necessary to irrigate, to flush the toilets, to, to you know, do whatever we, uh, whatever we need to do there. And then, you know, backup water you know, in that instance. Quality control, um, you know, preliminary treatment, you know, as we talked about that first flush filter, you know, it's probably the, you know, the, the first line of defense. You know, with any of these systems, it could be simple as simple as a collection catch basin, could be a concrete basin that's you know that's sitting outside of the building, um, close to the source, um, and you know being able to capture you know you know eighty twenty right, eighty percent TSS removal, um, you know leaves, grit, uh, trash, you know whatever you know we see it's just but but again it could be as simple, you know as a catch basin. Uh, we see a lot of these. Uh, type vortex filters. It's all originated from, from Europe. Um, you know they've been doing rainwater a lot longer than than we have. Although we are slowly starting to catch up there, um, these vortex type filters um, you know, come in handy um, that whenever they get into those siphonic roof drains, um, you know they they sort of serve a purpose. Uh, but they're like a pump, so you want to be careful. Um, you know from a design, you know from a design perspective, um, make sure that you're going to have that flow within these systems. Because that they maintain efficiency. If they're not maintaining that you know, that 90% efficient efficiency, <clears throat> that means we're just losing you know all of that water that maybe we could have captured, we could put into that storage vessel uh, that's going right to drain. Um, so being able to you know use this in the right application, um, you know, kind of goes a long way. Uh, you know, from from the efficiency side of it, um, and they you know we just we we find that they have their place. The other kind of lesson learned here too is. Um, be careful when you put these things inside of a building. Make sure that there's uh, floor drains, and uh, you know they're they're you know they're just not anywhere where you know the potential for flooding could occur. Um, you know, we've had some instances where they plumbed them up uh, supposedly incorrectly, didn't have a long enough run into the uh, into the unit itself, um, and then they get back pressure, and it was blowing the lids off of them. So it's it's something to you know again we can check with the you know, with the manufacturer um, or with the vendor on installation, but, um, we, you know, we're, we're very uh, cognizant about where these things go. We'd like to see them outside the building uh, and not inside. Larger systems, 
um, you know, that are you know sort of made to order, uh, you know, if you will, when you when you when you're talking about a filter or if, you know a vortex filter, this is a, you know a system. Um, things like 60 feet up in the air, um, so there was really kind of no other way to you know to do it, uh, but to be able to put these you know these vortex filters you know way way up above. So access is 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 a little bit limited uh, you know to the system. Um, there is some ways to be able to drain it, but and again, this is just sort of um, you know building it to the to the facility uh, and being able to again provide that first flush filter that you know that mechanism to um, you know keep that as much of that material uh, out of the storage vessel or, or treat it you know as possible there could be instances where um, we see you know initially i would even say like 10 years ago um, pulling water off of a parking deck pulling water off of a uh, you know a paved area was a no-no and in china reeves that people just didn't understand um, you know the concepts of you know oil oil removal the types of sediment just the types of flows i mean you know think about you know a 2000 you know a 200,000 square foot building um you know with a roof area um you know you're talking about you know a couple of inches of rain per hour uh, potentially you know and the, and the flows associated with that i think people just had a you know a hard time but <clears throat> when you you know when you work with other stormwater you know companies stormwater people that you know sort of you know understand the you know the concepts and the you know the pitfalls and the parameters you know associated with these type of flows and you know what could be present in there um you know we see uh, this, these sand oil interceptors or these you know these these type of interceptors kind of getting put into there uh, as a mainstream application so again depending on where we're pulling from you can see you know sort of the theme here there's a, there's a lot of different you know applications and you know and ways to sort of you know be able to uh, make sure that we're getting that tr you know that pre-treatment and it's how important it is so that we don't have it in in a storage vessel and integral you know type components um you know again with this is get this is getting bigger um with other manufacturers and vendors that are out there um you know the more uh, you know we, we can sort of uh, you know package systems together i think that you know just the easier it is for for everybody involved and then you know just the treatment aspect of it um and being able to quantify that treatment <clears throat> i think goes a long way uh, with these systems um and and again it goes directly to maintenance as well um you know, trying to maintain these things i mean in some instances you have again a couple hundred thousand gallons worth of storage um you know you don't want to waste that um but again you don't want to have it be in being uh, maintenance uh, intrusive uh, as well. Same for, for an above ground situation, um, you know, just being able to, you know, filtration, uh, pre-filtration is just super important. Storage systems, uh, you know, as we talked about storage systems is, you know, again, it's the most expensive, but it's the most important part of any of these, having secure storage, um, making sure that we have, you know, no groundwater infiltration, making sure that the system that's going in the ground, um, you know, because again, you have these huge buildings, um, you know, you have to have, you know, an eighth inch per foot fall to get that storm water, that drain water to, you know, to that system, to that, you know, that component. Um, so sometimes these things get pretty deep in the ground. Um, so you got to be cognizant of, you know, you know, raw calculations and overburden and, excuse me, depth of bury, um, you know, because, uh, you know, we, whenever, you know, anything like this goes in, you don't want to see it come out, you know, unexpectedly. So um, those are all key aspects from a design standpoint, um, you know, getting the, you know, getting the civil guy uh, involved right away so that we do know, you know, potential cuts and how deep these, you know, the, the, the these systems, these components might be if they are going underground. It's, it's just very, very important, um, to, you know, to get that right up front. Sizing. Um, probably you know again one of the most important things that you know that we can do again we're lucky uh, here uh, you know on the east coast sort of uh, east of the mississippi you know we see a lot of that green uh, we're lucky we did that we get the rainfall that we get um you know, this year you know especially here in new hampshire we just got inundated with rain we got more than what we needed or what we deserved but um you know being green like this you know you know you have you're in the you know the 30 to you know potentially 60 inches of rain you know, on average per year. Um, so it's it's important to know, you know, what kind of rainfalls we do get from the, you know, from the stormwater side of it and sort of how we, you know, we dictate those. Um, we also not have to need to know the, the days between rain events. Um, you know, again, it's not super important for you guys in Ohio. I mean, us in New Hampshire and, you know, sort of in the New England, we're not in tune or not, you know, uh, you know, att attuned to that, um, 
you know, to the dryness, um, you know, to, you know, to the days between rain events, but it's just something that we need to know that we look at, you know, exclusively <clears throat> when we're, um, when we're sizing these systems. Um, so, you know, we, we sort of have our own little calculators, but, you know, at the end of the day, if you have one inch of rain uh, over one square foot of roof, um, you could potentially capture 0. 0.623 gallons of water, right? So it's sort of a, very, uh, it's not a variable, it's sort of a, you know, there's like a mainstream, you know, number concept. Doesn't make any difference if it's a, you know, slanted roof or a flat roof or a paved area or whatever. Um, you know, we, we have that as a, you know, as a standard. So uh, whenever I'm doing um, sizing or helping somebody look at, you know, sizing for a rainwater system, instead of saying, hey, I got a, uh, I'm flushing, you know, 15 toilets and I'm irrigating an acre of land and I got, 100 gallons a minute cooling tower makeup water. Um, I always start here, right? I want to go. I want to find out how much water, how much uh, you know potential, you know, do I have, you know, for storage? What what can I get off of that roof, right? So, uh, in this example, if I had 15,000 square feet of roof, my 0.623 multiplier, um, and in, in this instance, uh, you know, I just said I'm averaging four and three quarter inches of rain per month. I could potentially get or store 44,000 gallons of water off of that roof. Um, doesn't mean um, that I need all that. Maybe I need more, but that's where you should start from a you know, from a supply standpoint, uh, so that we can understand you know what's available and what is needed um, to you know to, you know for you know for any kind of future application. So that's kind of where we get into the water balance chart. Is I can literally get in here and say, okay, there's my 15,000 square feet of roof. Uh, in this instance, I'm averaging 41 inches of rain uh, per year. But I break that down into months, and we use NOAA. Um, you know, for, you know, for that 30 year uh, rainwater uh, average. So it gives us a good, you know, sort of a good basis of, of, of you know, what, of what we're doing here, but I can, you know, break it down into monthly averages and that sort of gives me my supply, right? That's, that's that water balance that we talked about from the, from the Ohio uh, rain and land development uh, manual. This tells me exactly, you know, how much I can get every month. Uh, and then we can just put the demand side of it in there. Um, so sort of to tell us, you know, what, what is needed uh, and maybe, you know, potentially for what size tank that we would need, you know, in this, we just go back in this application, right? So it's, you know, uh, you know, in this instance, uh, saying I'm getting 44,000, uh, but, you know, over the, uh, you know, over these months, you know, it could be, uh, you know, it could be a little bit less, you know, based on the rainfall and the rainfall calculations. Um, so we want to sort of balance that out between our supply and our demand, right? So if I only need 20,000 gallons of water, um, you know, based on my monthly average for toilet flushing, then, you know, maybe we go with a 15,000 gallon uh, storage vessel, you know, or maybe we go with a little bit more and then we send some uh, water to, um, uh, you know, to underground infiltration. But, um, you know, just understanding, you know, that we don't want to have too much storage and then we don't want to have too less of a storage because, uh, again, your, your, your numbers just don't balance out. Um, and, you know, in some instances that stormwater management is going to tell you, you need a certain amount of storage anyway, and then you can just control pump it, you know, again, for groundwater control or uh, send it to, a, you know, to the, to, to the storm, uh, you know, to the to storm system or to a detention area. Um, but it's just super important to understand that um, storage is the most expensive part of it. So, um, you know, we want to be cognizant of, of uh, you know, how we do it. Um, large vessel here, underground tank. Uh, could be uh, HDPE cisterns. Uh, we see these a lot out there. Um, they have these uh, these milk crate type applications where they'll use a membrane, uh, you know, down low, and then they'll wrap these crates, uh, and the crates will kind of serve as a uh, as a sediment control, but as a storage vessel as well. It could go, it could go into parking lots, you know, manifolding, uh, you know, a lot of this polyethylene together, uh, hand core and ADS. I think are one and the same now, but. Um, they do a lot of these you know, these type of storage vessels again in, in parking areas, um, you know where again you're us utilizing that that area, but it's underground, out of sight, out of mind, cooler you know cooler conditions, secure, um, but they're they're a big part of of uh, uh, you know what you know what, what's what's out there and what's available from a storage aspect. <clears throat> Getting deep into you know burial depths, um, there could be instances where you know you need to put ribs. Uh, on these tanks, these type systems to be able to, um, you know, make sure that that tank isn't going to uh, compress, isn't going to deflect, um, you know, isn't going to, uh, 
you know, have you know have any issues with it. So again, knowing the you know the, the what's going, you know, how deep a burial will going, the overburden, you know, that sort of thing, you know, just kind of goes a long way to how we put these things on the ground, where they're gonna go, the location, that could be another big, you know, a, a big part of it. Um, fiberglass, um, you know, again, that's a big part of storage and storage vessels that we see uh, in the uh, the rainwater application in the rainwater world. So there's there's a lot of different uh, you know products that are available to you know to the designer uh, when when these systems are being built. Manifolding tanks together, uh, yeah, that's again another you know, another key thing that we see out there uh, when you get into these bigger buildings and these larger facilities that have. Um, you know, just it's just need all of this storage for stormwater. You know, those you know being able to manifold the tanks, whether you step the you know the excavation down so that your um, you know your tanks are you know sort of bouncing out that water. Um, but again, it's all part of the storage and the design you know concepts. We see a lot of cast in place concrete cisterns. Um, you know, th this just seems to be you know big in you know bigger cities where. You know they're you know they're putting it you know right off you know right you know right in the beginning you know as I said the one thing that you know tends to be forgotten is how are we getting water out of that tank how are we going to be able to have access to those pumps um, you know so again being you know right front and center from a you know when these things are being designed and how they're being designed um, you know just kind of goes a long way to uh, you know to be you know the you know do do it from a maintenance standpoint and you know again and understanding that application I can't I can't say that enough we did a Big job here in in Boston, the Encore Casino. Um, they have a hundred thousand gallon concrete cistern um, that went inside of the building. So we did the engineering from the rainwater system. You know, three or four years before the building was even going to be built, they said they just wanted a basic, you know, irrigation system. Just give us a you know a vortex filter and and um, UV and you know just simple simple basic system. Well, when the system gets you know, starts to go online. We find out we're we're actually irrigating like three million dollars worth of plants that they have all throughout this building, um, and the system just wasn't really designed for that. It wasn't really kind of set up to handle all these zones and the low flow in this zone and the higher flow in that zone. It just we you know we just weren't aware of those you know those type of curveballs, those type of you know applications. So, you know, from a design standpoint, if you can get everybody involved, you know the the, the the architect, the you know, the civil engineer, um, the irrigation, uh, you know, contractor, if you know, if at all possible, if you know, if any of those parameters are known, or you know, what we need, and you know, pumping, um, you know, the pumping aspects, um, just it just goes a long way on helping us uh, get get the right system for the you know for that for that right for that right facility. Excuse me. Uh, it's typical underground tank and sort of, you know, how that, you know, laid out um, pumps and, and controls and, you know, access to the pumps from grade and floating suctions. Um, you know, the floating suction is important in that, um, you know, we have a float in here that keeps us, that keeps our, our supply or our suction side of it about a foot below uh, static water level. So it's always going up and down at static water level. So we're kind of taking the best water out of that tank. We're not taking anything off the top, not taking anything off the bottom. Um, kind of staying in in that good zone of uh, of water quality, uh, so it just goes a long way to uh, you know to, to, to filtration and disinfection and you know simplifying that whole aspect. When we get into above ground applications, uh, we might have to look at freeze protection, um, whether we use heaters or aeration or or you know some kind of recirc line or recircs. Uh, it's something that you know, again from the from the design side of it, we need to really look at that. You know, right up front, so we're not missing any of that too many times. <clears throat> We've seen, you know, tanks go down, and you know, nobody, you know, sort of took that into play, or somebody thought that they were going to drain the tank, and then they decided not to, you know, not to drain it. Um, they want to use it full time, so uh, freeze protection in an above ground application, depending on where we are, is pretty important from a design side of it. Uh, we see a lot of these tank and tank systems go into the building first thing. Um, they're for at the very bottom of a facility. You have these places with uh, zero lot lines, right? New York City, um, you know, any of your bigger cities, Boston has a lot of this. These guys go, um, you know, three or four stories down inside the building, um, and we use rectangular tanks in these applications because we can just maximize the footprint, right? It's you know, supply as much storage as we can possibly in that in that area and that footprint. But whenever you get into rectangular tanks, you see a lot more bracing uh, and a lot more uh, you know, infrastructure to the tank itself uh, to be able to you know, make sure it's going to be um, secure and, and hold the water. 
talk about innovative design, uh, you know, again, you got to be creative in some instances, be able to maximize that that storage potential, um, and be able to get them in there. Um, you can see this is sort of a, a puzzle that we did in, in New York City, but I just wanted to show you this more from a you know from an innovative design standpoint, where you know we're going around uh, piers and uh, you know it's being put into the you know the, the you know the, the shallows of this of this building, and then you know this tank could sit there for two or three years before it you know it gets started up. But you know we have the storage available for that facility to be able to meet their stormwater their stormwater needs. And then just a, another application, sort of showing you know this is partially buried. There's a water stop there, um, and then they'll pour the floor around that, and then uh, get you to the top. Pumps, um, pumps, and pumps controls, and, and, and again access to the pumps. I can't say that enough. Um, don't want anybody going into a tank. It's it's confined space. It's it's like 4,500 bucks a pop to get you know a, a OSHA certificate to be able to go down in there, and um, it's just. It's, even though it's just water, it's just not the you know the safest thing in the world to be doing. So, uh, you know, being able to have access to everything from grade um, is just sort of my my number one, uh, you know, pet peeve or you know it's my number one thing when, whenever we're doing any design. It doesn't make any difference, you know. Again, if it's concrete or fiberglass or whatever, having access to grade um, number one priority. Treatment <clears throat> when we get above ground. And we start pumping. Um, there's, you know, there's certain, uh, you know, parameters that we need to hit from from a uh, from a you know from a, a treatment side of it, uh, disinfection, sediment control, you know, that kind of thing. Um, I think ASPE was in the 75 micron range. Um, we like to see it more in the 10 micron range um, for for a bunch of different reasons. It just helps us out in the long run from a water quality standpoint on the on the very you know end of this these type systems. But it just goes a long way. In uh, you know, in simplifying the process, uh, filtration. Um, you know, again, that's depending on you know what we're using the water for. Our filtration could be as simple as cartridge filters. You know, we see these all the time. Pretty mainstream, very very inexpensive. Um, you know, they come in all different sh you know shapes and sizes. Um, but we got to know. You know, you, you sort of want to know a couple things. And number one, we want to know what you know what we're using the water for. But you want to know who the you know who's going to inherit this system. Are they going to be able to go down and change a filter if I if I get a little bit of a pressure increase, you know, across that filter? We have that pressure gauge that goes off and tells me we have an alarm. Uh, is somebody going to be able to go down there and um, you know replace those cartridge filters, or are they just going to put it in bypass? Right. That's the thing I hate the most is. People put these things in, and then you know you go back, you know, a couple months later, and they're in bypass because nobody wants to deal with it because nobody knew they had to deal with it. Uh, bag bag filters are the same thing, probably you know, sort of super mainstream, been around forever, uh, but it's more of a manual type filter. You got to be able to replace those bags. You got to be able to know what's going on in there, have pressure differentials, you know, across there to know you know what's you know what's going on, and and be able to uh, replace them. Media filters. Um, you heard me talk a lot about media filters in the beginning from a, from an application standpoint. Um, you know, probably one of the best filters, you know, or type of filters or filter technology that's out there because they utilize you know different types of media in there to be able to target all different types of constituents. I don't need to know exactly what's coming off of that roof. I just need to know that in that media, I can you know get you down to a you know a certain micron level, uh, and I have a bunch of different. Um, you know, forms or, or, you know, forms or functions to be able to, to, to be able to do that. Uh, and we can put any kind of media in here that we need to, uh, to be able to target those constituents. So super important. The beauty of this type filter, is it does have an auto automatic back flush uh, function so that nobody's going to have to worry about, excuse me, worrying about, you know, changing, you know, changing anything out or going down there and putting it in backwash mode. Um, and the beauty of again of this system is that media lasts five to seven years, and we've had some where they've been out there for a lot longer than that. So pretty durable filter, but again, it's based on flow. So the bigger the flow, the bigger the filter. These type filters are really really good in the irrigation application, uh, where we have higher flows, you know, 100 gallons a minute, 200 gallons a minute, 500 gallons a minute. Um, they work very very well. Uh, they have a screen in there that traps the the, the particles uh, in the screen, and then we just you know go into back flush mode. Uh, they just charge that it takes about 10 seconds. Uh, but again, smaller surface area, smaller screens, 
Um, you want to be careful with, you know, again, the application where you're pulling water from, so you're not masking that screen, because uh, sometimes, you know, it'll just get to the point where uh, it's, again, just becomes labor intensive because the, you just don't have enough surface area to meet the, uh, you know, the water quality needs or the, you know, the, the water quality that's in your cistern. Uh, so just, again, marrying the right components up to the, to the right uh, uh, application is, 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 again, is the way to go. Um, disinfection, uh, oxidizers, a couple of different oxidizers that we know of uh, that are utilized out there, you know, sort of mainstream chlorine, you know, again, it's pretty, pretty mainstream, um, more of a commodity type of, of scenario, ozone, uh, probably the most effective uh, oxidizer known to man, you know, that third molecule of oxygen kills just about anything, but it's regulated by the EPA, um, and then UV, UV disinfection is, again, I think from a Rainwater side of it, we see that a lot more, um, you know, because it's so much easier to you know, to maintain and to and to uh, and to deal with. Um, but again, it just takes that you know that, that little bit more uh, upfront. So we have we don't we're not having all kinds of sediment control in there. Typical chlorinations, you know, all different types of chlorinators, as, as you can see. Somebody's going to maintain these tablet chlorinators, um, you know, metering pump chlorinators. Um, Chlorination, uh, chlorine generators. Um, there's just a lot of, <clears throat> or not a lot, a little bit more maintenance involved with UV. Then a bulb life is like 10,000 hours, which is about a year. Um, very, very little that needs to be done here. Again, it's the front end that you got to, you know, that you want to be very cognizant of. The, you know, the better your filtration is up front, uh, the longer your uh, your bulb's going to last. The better maintenance you're going to get out of the system. Um, and then again, just the overall better disinfection quality because you're adding crypto uh, to the you know, to the disinfection technology rather than chlorine. Um, ozone don't see that that much out there, so I'm not going to kind of get into that. Um, and then you know, sort of <clears throat> looking at some of the systems and the system designs, uh, I call this a you know, sort of like a standalone you know kind of a scenario where you, if you remember from some of the schematics I showed you. You know, we have our skid system here, so we have our, you know, our cistern tank on the outside of the building. We're pumping up through our skid. There's my media filter. I have UV in the background, chlorine and dye in this instance, um, and then controls um, pumps again to a day tank. Uh, in this application, um, we're flushing toilets, and my booster pump is over here to the right. But this kind of gives you everything, so that I showed you in the schematic. Um, there's your purple pipe, you know, before it's insulated. Um, so you have, you know, sort of this. Sort of standalone, I guess, if you called it, uh, or that's what I call it, sort of a standalone system. I have plenty of room in this facility to be able to put, you know, this type of technology in there. But all the components, you know, are relatively the same, um, and the layout is, is, you know, is again per per design. Another one similar, you know, kind of application toilet flushing. Uh, this is. Just a really good detail, 1000 gallon day tank that's to make up water going into the day tank from above. Um, PLC controller, um, booster pump, you know, again, all the, all the same kind of scenarios. Um, more of a modular kind of a system here, but it's more to show the, you know, the various types of, of, of medias that are needed for this application. Um, you know, we would have a, a regular multimedia filter, then we would have our organics for our carbon, and then we have pH, so we know that this is for cooling tower makeup water, because we saw that we need that much more, um, you know, for the, you know, for that system. Um, and they wanted a little bit of chlorine uh, uh, in there to help, you know, with any of the organics or the biologics that may be, you know, present in there. So we just scored a little bit of that in there. Booster pump, um, you know, in that application. So, and then, you know, again, just a simpler kind of a system. Um, we have regular sediment filters here, cartridge type filters, a two stage process. Um, you know, but again, this is more to show. You know, I just had to go through a door, uh, so it's very, very skinny skid. You know, being able to have everything plumbed and 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 wired at the factory, you know, just kind of goes a long way. It was easy for you know for the contractor just to, to install it. Uh, but you can sort of see that you know the different types of technologies that are used. And again, it's going to be dependent on you know the, the end user and the application and you know where it's you know where it's going. Um, it's a pretty large system. Pr pretty proud of this one. Biggest system that we've ever done to date at Harvard Science Center. It was rated like the second most healthiest building in the world uh, recently. It's it's just won all kinds of awards. Um, you know, obviously, being Harvard, they dumped 
you know, a, a ton of money into this, but we were in there at the ground level. They have 150,000 gallons worth of stormwater capacity, uh, you know, in this facility, and they're using reasonable water for uh, for arrow, for irrigation, for toilet flushing, for cooling tower makeup, and just uh, just a pretty incredible system. And you know, you can again see some of the different components that are in here uh, to be able to get us the water quality that we need to send out through the system. Another type of skid, again, using you know. Uh, you know, everything I sort of talked about, you know, here's a, a sediment filter as a pre-filter to, uh, to a vortex type filter. And, uh, you know, we have um, you know, all different kinds of, of, you know, of other components in here. So, um, you know, just kind of wrapping up here. I know getting a little bit uh, in a time crunch. You can kind of see what, what we're doing here from an element standpoint. Um, package systems, um, you know, match the, uh, you know, your, your, your filtration skids to the application, um, PLC controllers to be able to go back to building management. Um, you know, just a, you know, a lot of different, you know, booster pumps, um, you know, typical boosters, day tanks, um, you know, the, you know, that kind of thing. Um, you know, it's, it's all part of this, um, you know, the structure and how it's kind of put together. So, um, again, give us, you know, give us a call if you need it, you know, any help in the design side of it. Um, Jim's, you know, James is always available. You know to be able to help out uh, you know on that side of it uh, and again you know all the controls go back to building management so um, you know again thank you for your time uh, appreciate you know being able to present you know to you guys and um, you know if you have any questions or concerns or any, anything you can get with us thanks Mike that was a great presentation um, yeah if you guys have any questions or concerns uh, just give me a call and I'll work it out with you all um, yeah, this presentation was recorded. It's going to be on our YouTube channel uh, later today. So if you want to share it with anybody, just uh, head over to our YouTube channel. It'll be on there. And again, I'll be sending out your ASPE CEUs here soon. Um, and please join us for our next class, which is December 7th, over uh, going over water quality. So thanks again, Mike, and thanks you all for uh, joining us today. I hope you have a great rest of your day, rest of your week, rest of your month, and I'll uh, talk to you soon. All right. Thank See you. See ya. Bye.